Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word. Hey, we're going to start a new book today, Book of Mark. Mark comes from, is a Latin name, and it comes from Mars or a man of war in relationship to Mars. But this was only his surname. His real name was John. John means gift of God. Uh, you can document this in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, and understand there that, that um, Mark's mother, whose name was Mary, one of the Marys. It was the Mary that Peter uh, and many of the disciples housed there. It was the house in which even Peter, when he was freed from jail by angels, went to Mary's house where John was. John was not a disciple. John was a teenager, basically, but he followed Peter and the others, and because they were centered at his mother's home, he picked up much that happened. Twenty-six times in his gospel, he mentions the word a noun or immediately, vivaciously, it moves. That youth uh, it within Mark brings forth that action of, of the very gospel itself. Some scholars believe it was, probably was the earliest of the gospels. Uh, we know from the ma manuscripts that his cousin was um, Barnabas, and Barnabas was from Cyprus, but that does not necessarily mean that Mark was from Cyprus because Mark's mother had a home in the Jerusalem area. So um, fascinating as we make a study of this youth as he would bring forth this gospel. And so it is. So let's go with it, if we may. Chapter 1, verse 1 in the great book of Mark, verse 1 reads, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a Hebraism. And, you know, it is a, it is a strange thing that, that uh, the New Testament so-called originally was named the New Covenant. It was diathiaki, um, which um, is a Greek word that means covenant. I think we lose a lot when you don't think of it in that way. It's the New Covenant made by God, overlapping the Old Covenant from the Old Testament. You see, covenant is family, and that's the family of God. So. Uh, it is believed by scholars that probably Jerome from the Latin manuscripts changed the name to Testament, uh, be that as it may. Jerome was a good scholar. I'm not trying to take away from him, but he, he did a good work. But uh, he is the one, it is believed from the Latin that picked up the word testimony, which is to say testimony in English. But um, diathika, uh, D-I-A, T-H-E-K-E uh, is a, a Greek word meaning covenant. It can't be translated any other way. It is the new covenant. It's the covenant that God made with you if you believe, if you accept this son, if you accept this one he sent, then certainly it isn't just a testament, the good news. It's a family covenant that makes you part of that family. So it was the beginning, <clears throat> and it was that covenant that this one Jesus Christ brought forth. Uh, verse 2, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. <clears throat> and of course, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. But I like to take it from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to it. You won't have it, but listen to me. Malachi 3, 1. 
This is what he's quoting here. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. The reason I'm taking you here is this word covenant. It is a family covenant. Whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And there he came and he anchored and he established that covenant so that you in believing and following him and participating in the family of God, doing that that he instructs you, whether you be one of God's elect or, or simply one of free choice, doesn't matter. In him, you find that salvation. Verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so it is that he sent that messenger, and that messenger was John the Baptist, who, of course, was, um, was sent, and not that he was Elijah, but that he was sent in the spirit of Elijah. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In other words, that's to say to, to have a change of mind. Um, to have a change of mind does not supply grace, but grace can follow if you absorb the covenant, if you accept it, if you become a part of it, if you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, And there went out unto him all the land of Judea. This means there was a steady stream. They didn't just a few come here and there. There was just a stream of them that came out from Jerusalem to the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Jordan means the descender, and that's what the river was where John would be there in that river, that ford at the river, baptizing and bringing forth the good news, bringing forth the covenant. The messenger foresent by Almighty God that the way would be prepared for Christ at his first advent. John the Baptist being in the spirit of Elijah. You can find documentation for this in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, 16 and 17, that John, not that he was Elijah, but that before he was born, it was stated by God that he would come in the spirit of Elijah, meaning he would be doing the Elijah ministry, which is to do what? To turn the hearts of the children to the fathers, plural. You see, there's two. There's the true father and then there's Satan. And many times if you, if you teach a message that causes people to accept the first Messiah that appears soon, it's none other than the Antichrist. You don't want to turn their hearts to receive he that comes at the sixth trump, the sixth seal, the sixth vial. That's 666. A child can understand that and is warned in Revelation 13, 18 of the 666. You know, the true Christ, this messenger brought the message, does not come until 777. That is to say, the seventh trump, the seventh seal, and the seventh vial. Then you can rejoice, because even then does the, the second advent transpire. But here we have John the Baptist preparing the way for the first advent, when repentance of sins and being invited into the covenant, the marriage, the family, was, was laid open that all could participate whom chose to. Verse 6, And John was clothed with um, camel's hair and, um, and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and honey. And of course, um, this, this is um, the uh, diet of a, of a prophet, okay, as it was written. Verse um, you can document that in, in um, 2 Kings uh, 1 through 8, where he, Elijah himself in person would be out in camel skin. Um, not, not skin, a, a coat woven from camel hair. 
and and um, and he would be there. And when when fifty would come to him saying, "Prophet, come with me," and he, the prophet of God, he said, if I'm, "If I'm a prophet of God, may fire come down, womb." And fifty were destroyed. You don't mess with the prophet of God, or it will backfire on you. And so it was that uh, Elijah, that's Second Kings chapter one verse eight. You can cover that. John, in the spirit of that same one, verse seven. What was he doing? And preaching, saying, "There cometh one mightier than I, after me." The latcheth of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I'm just, I couldn't even do that. <clears throat> he's coming, and he's talking about Messiah, the only begotten, the Son of God. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it is true that that Holy Spirit would come. There are, There is a belief that now that you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit, you have no need of being baptized in water. And I, I, that is a fallacy and a false teaching. Because Christ set the way for us. Christ was baptized in water. The word baptism, the etymology of it, comes from that you dyeing a piece of cloth. In other words, it must go all the way under water. If you're coloring it red, it's a white cloth. It must go all the way under to be, to be baptized in that water and brought forth. And so it is that one must be baptized, submerged um, in water, wash, symbolically of washing away sin, but at the same time mainly symbolizing Christ, that you believe Christ went into the tomb, but that he arose, that he resurrected uh, into eternal life. Uh, so that makes it very necessary. But that's what this one was doing. And he's announcing and preparing the way for Messiah. Verse 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized of John in the Jordan, in the water, by this one. And, um, and, and yes, Christ was baptized. Why? He always set the way for us to follow. Verse 10, and straightway, there's that word that this one Mark enjoys using, instantly it means. Immediately, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. And the Spirit, like a dove descending upon him. How precious it is that the Word of God is so full of knowledge if you just listen to it. What is the word dove in the Hebrew tongue? It's Jonah, Yonah. Well, what does, what does Yonah mean? Well, there was one name, Yonah, Jonah. That was his name, dove. Why? Because he would go in the whale's belly three days and yet would come forth and save Nineveh. As Christ would be in the tomb three days and come forth and save the world or provide salvation for the world if it so chose. <clears throat> and where does this word, what does it mean? Um, uh, this yayan, um, um, it, yomna, it comes from... Um, the word yayan and the coo of a dove. It means that the, the Spirit warms you, and yet at the same time, the melody of that beautiful dove in harmony and love and caring, that's, that's the feeling in the, of the touch of the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, in, a, in likeness. Uh, and so it is that when that dove came forth, then the Holy Spirit, its very presence, all the time teaching with that word yona, okay, bringing forth that deeper truth that this one would be in that tomb three days, but he would resurrect, to verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The very voice of God himself giving credentials 
to the very one that was being baptized, that is to say the Son of God, that is the beginning of the gospel, that is to say the Lord Jesus Christ. How precious it is that that covenant was laid bare for anyone that would participate God's election to expedite it and exercise it and free will to accept of it and cloak yourself in it whereby you could find salvation, rest, and peace of mind. There's only one true peace of mind, and that's the peace of mind that comes from that Holy Spirit giving you confidence and knowledge you're okay. Everything is cool. God's on the throne. You're his child and he's going to take care of you. Why? He loves you. That's why. That's what the covenant means. It covers. Verse 12, and immediately there again that youth, immediately, vivaciously moving forth, the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Um, not, not to, why, why, would, why would the Spirit do that? To show us how to get it done. He's going to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan is going to be there to tempt him. And Satan will use scripture from Deuteronomy, from the Psalms, 91, many other scriptures. There's just one problem. Satan is a scripture lawyer that has a head full of knowledge and a spirit full of knowledge of the word. There's just one problem. When, when you read in Matthew 4 the very words he would speak, he takes that scripture and twists it right at the end 90 degrees out of shape. In other words, he changes the word of God as he was quoting to Christ, trying to get Christ to kneel to him, to obey him, to worship him. And naturally, Christ would ultimately say, Get behind me, Satan! and he would have no choice but to retreat. But I always wonder how many Christians today are familiar enough with God's Word that if Satan was tempting them, if they would know whether he was quoting correctly or incorrectly. That's why it's so important for you to be founded in the Word of God whereby you at least know right from wrong, up from down, and truth from fiction. And to be able to ascertain that simply intuitively. Why? Because you're a part of the covenant, the family that can spiritually discern good from evil and to know and understand through the word of God God comes salvation, comes peace of mind, comes freedom, freedom of anxiety and hang-ups of man and their traditions that make void the Word of God. Yeah, Satan could twist that scripture. That's why it makes a good study for you to know and understand. Verse 13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days. That's probation. That's what it stands for tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered unto him. That, that's a good sign for you to always remember. They helped him. God's not going to leave you alone if you're talking to him, if you're reaching out to him in faith. You don't even have to say it out loud. If your love toward him is there, he's going to minister to you. In other words, uh, you know, I get so many letters from people that say, I pray and I pray and I never get an answer. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think the last time you got in trouble, it just, pam, it just was over and nothing happened? Who do you think arranged that? And you say you never hear from God. God takes care of his own. And many people don't give him credit for doing, well, I thought it was just an accident. Then you're living an accident. God loves his children and he sends help. Angels are messengers. That's what the word means. And God can take care of his own. Uh, Satan would like to use scripture to deceive you. Uh, I'm, Satan can work from pulpits with false teaching better than about anywhere else. 
in deceiving Christians. Well, how do I, how do I as a lay person get around that? Simply read the Word of God. It's quite simple. Listen to God instead of man, this man or any other man, and let God lead you, and you'll never go too far wrong. God does send teachers. You don't have to wonder very long who has it and who does not. Verse 14, now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, Galilee is, means circuit. He was making that circuit. And poor old John the Baptist, it was time for him to, to um, unfortunately, um, he would be beheaded in a sad story for a different time, 15, and Christ teaching and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You have that change of mind and you believe the word of God. And the time was fulfilled that what? that the kingdom, well, what is kingdom? It's the king and his dominion. Christ was the king, and this whole world and the universe is his dominion. And what are you worried about? He takes care of his own, 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew. Simon means hearing, and Andrew means manly, his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. They were commercial fishers. 17, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Now, uh, certainly um, uh, he did not have an altar call there. He knew even from the first earth age, do not let that throw you if you don't understand it. That's fine. Put it on a shelf but he knew them beforehand. He knew he could depend on them. He knew what they were made of. He knew what their spirits consisted of. And he said, follow me. I will make fishers of men from you. And 18, and straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Now, what you want to remember is that a lot of people, you're supposed to cast a net of truth. If you truly, as a, a, a person of the covenant, if you will cast a net of truth, it will snag many people. But if you cast a net of falsehoods, whatever you catch is not fit to save, okay? because it's all false. So when you cast the net for Christ, then may it be his word his word of truth. Unfortunately, too many nets have holes in them that let truth escape out because they do not teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse what saith the Lord God Almighty. And unfortunately, it's not complete then. Be a fisher of men and fish with truth. Cast that net of truth. You'll always be successful. Verse 18, and straightway, again, there's immediately, they forsook their nets and followed him. Man, it didn't, it, they didn't have to think about it. 19, and when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James. Uh, that's the, uh, Jacob in the Hebrew tongue, the son of Zebedee, which means my gift, and John, gift of God, his brother, whom also were in the ship mending their nets. Boy, he sure picks on these fishermen, doesn't he? Verse 20, and straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. There wasn't any altar call. There wasn't any ifs here and there, and maybe, or maybe I'll let me, let me. No, they came because they heard the truth. They saw the truth. The truth was walking among them, for the very word itself became flesh and was walking among them. 21, and they went into Capernaum, the city of compassion, and straightway, immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. 
He didn't do it secretly. I mean, he boldly went right in. 22, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Well, well, how could this be? What did it mean he taught with authority? Well, do you know how scribes teach? They, they use the law of precedent. Okay. They go, well, according to this good teacher, it's thusly, and according to that good teacher, it's a different way. And according to this teacher, it's this way. He taught the Word of God straight forward, line on line, precept on precept, giving truth, casting a net of truth, with no ifs, no ands, no maybes, no yeas, no nays, straight on. That's what was different, and that's what's different today. Even our very courts themselves, our courts of law, are so steeped in precedence that they forget the very law that our nation was founded on and go by precedent of this judge said this and this judge decided that and what do judges know? They're men and, and apt to err in many ways. But our law that was set forth by our forefathers is taken from common law from England, which came from this King James Bible, the Word of God, precept on precept, and it's what should be held in courts even today. So that's what makes the difference. Verse 23, and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Now what he's going to teach you is there is a difference between an unclean spirit and a person that actually has a disease. You must have spiritual discernment to know there are both. Unfortunately, we have some people that like to cast a demon out of a person, let's say, with, that has epilepsy. Epilepsy is usually caused from injury at birth or from some other way. It is not an evil spirit. And if you are a true person of God, you can discern whether it's an evil spirit or an illness. That's a gift of God in anointing. But here, we definitely, it's declared, this was an unclean spirit, evil, saying, let us alone. It wasn't the man speaking, it was the spirits. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? They knew who he was. Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. They recognized him. Why? Because they were from before. You know, we have many people today that grow confused about... Uh, well, I think I can remember 400 years ago something that happened in Spain. No, you may be possessed of a spirit that was in someone else 400 years ago in Spain, but you don't remember it. You know, evil possession is a terrible thing. And there is no such thing as reincarnation other than to be carnate. That is to say, born from above. And that is one birth, one baptism, one death, period. Unless God so ordains otherwise, such as the case of Lazarus. But the, these evil spirits knew him. Why? Because they're from above. They're an evil spirit that came down from Satan, one of his followers. And they knew this was the Son of God, and whatever he said, they had to obey. Verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. You muzzle your mouth and come out of there. You know, that's, and you know, it's a wonderful thing that he gives you this authority if you have faith, if you are part of that family, if you are part of that covenant. That power remains. 26, and when the unclean spirit, had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. He had no choice. He had to do as Christ stated. Verse 27, And they were all amazed, inasmuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? 
What new doctrine is this? It wasn't new. For what a for with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And as it is written in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, if you are a part of that covenant, he even in his name instills that authority and power in you if you're man, woman, or child enough to use that to, to order anything negative out of your life, uh, to take command. Because you're a child of the living God. You are part of the covenant, the covenant of the living God that gives us that peace of mind and that freedom. Even in this confused world today, Again, I'll repeat, Luke 10, verse 18, verse 28. And immediately his fame, there's that vivacious little spirit of Mark again, was his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. I mean, that word flew. Of course it would. Why? Because he could cut it. He could get it done. Verse 29. And forthwith... When they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And so they, they went into Simon Peter's home. Okay. Verse 30, But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and a noun, there's that word again, it means immediately, they tell him of her. Now here, this documents that Peter was married, he had a wife, he had a mother-in-law, and he had a home of his own. Okay. Verse 31, And he came and took her by the hand, Christ did, and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. She served them. Instantly that touch. You know, the anointing, uh, you can anoint a person that is very ill, and chances are the hospital will send them home the same day. It's the power of God. You want to be able to recognize that when you see it. Does man do this? No. God does. Our Father, our Heavenly Father. Verse 32. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased. Now this is not possessed. This is actual sickness. And then that were possessed with devils. I want you to know there was two there, both both illness and evil spirits. A teacher of God's Word must be able to discern between the two to be a servant of the living God. What a fascinating chapter in this great book of life, this life of the covenant, the covenant that God made with His children, this new covenant that takes over from the old, that is to say the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the beginning of the gospel, the good news that gives us freedom of mind. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is, as it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived. And Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular individual uh, or organization. We don't judge people. We don't need to. God does. Okay. 
You just teach His Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, let the chips fall wherever they may. Never, never apologize for the Word of God, and you'll do quite well. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, got a prayer request? Don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows where you are and what you're thinking. All you have to do is talk to Him. You don't even have to say it out loud. Why? You're His child, and He loves you. He does hear you. He will answer you when it is best for you, if you are part of that covenant, if you love Him. So let's go to His throne. Father, around the globe at this time, we come to Your throne. We ask that You lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with um, Ted from Oklahoma. In Ecclesi in, in Ecclesiastes 3.3, 3, the right-hand column refers to Psalms 88, 31, 34. There is no 31, 34 verses in Psalms 88. You know, there are very few errors in the Companion Bible. This is an error. And just cut that in half instead of Psalms 88, make it 44, but make it verse 22. I'm, I'm going to say it again. Make it Psalms 44, not 88, 44, it's a copyist error, and make it read verse 22, and you'll be all right. A time for everything. Um, Be Bioni from Georgia. Is everyone who has ever died in paradise, even the sinners? Yeah, but there's a little different story to that. There's a gulf in the center of paradise, and they're on the wrong side. You see, what it means is God is, we only have one judge, and that's our Heavenly Father. So naturally, everyone spiritually must go to Him to be judged and uh, that which happens at the end of the great millennium period. But there, as you read in Luke 16, there is a gulf in the middle of paradise. Some at the judgment seat of Christ overcome through salvation. Some don't make it. And there they stand, ready to be judged. Duke from Texas, could you explain the flaming sword that turneth every way? And you're referring to the great book of Genesis when they were driven from the garden. What, what is the sword of God? It's the tongue. Documentation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And it cuts both ways. But God is a consuming fire. And it is that fire is a spirit, the spirit of God. And it does change, it protects, it leads, it guides, it directs. There is no way man can go against that particular sword, the Word of God. Uh, Jacqueline from Florida. Where in the Bible does it talk about the gulf? Luke chapter 16. That comes, Isn't it strange how uh, that particular subject comes up? But that's uh, Luke 16 will give you the gulf, right? The, it's, it is even a medical, Luke was a medical doctor. And the word gulf is a medical term. You can check it out and gapping wound. Okay. Um, Latoya from Georgia. What is the key of David? The key of David is knowing the correct genealogy and truth concerning David and he that would come from him out of Jesse, out of the root, would come the Savior. And that Savior, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The key of David, which only the Church of Philadelphia, that one that God so loved that he gave them the key of David that opens doors and no man can close and closes doors that no man can open, because they have the truth, the truth of who the true Christ is in opposition to the false. The key of David gives you a guarantee. It unlocks the truth to the fact that you're not going to be deceived by the false one because you know who he is. 
Helen from Ohio. I understand that there are three earth ages, but in Revelation 21, where it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth age, and the first heaven and the first earth age passed away. Shouldn't that say second heaven and second earth age? No, no. It, there's still some reckoning to do with, um, with that, uh, this present, uh, the second, and the new one is the third, but the first one is past history then. It's what you did in the second that is answered for in the third. The word there is a little confusing. It, it doesn't say there is a new world. It says this world is rejuvenated. You, you need to do a little work on new there. It would be better translated renewed or rejuvenated because there's not going to be a new world. It's simply a new age. And that new age, this earth is going to be put back in the shape it was originally. The, the um, ketubo, when God put this earth even, true north and magnetic north are 90 miles apart. Okay. We've got a wobble. And this brought in the, the firmament that protected this earth from people aging and all that sort of thing fell. It's going to go back, and this earth, there'll be no jet streams, no storms. The water will be, earth will be watered by dew each night. That's rejuvenated. That's the new earth age. Uh, Barbara from California, what is the katabo? The katabo, katabo is a Greek word that means the overthrow. It is most often translated into English as foundation, meaning the foundation of the world. Example. Uh, Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. I chose you before the foundations of the world. The word in the Greek is katabo. I chose you before the overthrow of Satan. Meaning what? Meaning that when Satan rebelled as it is written in, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, the final judgment uh, for him, then, then at that time, uh, Satan was certainly uh, uh, sentenced to die, to be turned to ashes from within at the end of this, this uh, uh, the millennium. But uh, actually, you were chosen because you stood against him when he rebelled in the beginning. That's why God knows he can trust his election. They's, they've already proved themselves doesn't make them any better than anyone else. It just means they're sharp and they're on the ball and they dislike Satan and they're real warriors against him. Elliot from Mississippi, will the Antichrist be a human being? Absolutely not. There's only one person that is instead of Christ and that is Satan. He, he wants that place. He always, you know, his first sin was that he was the cherub that protecteth the mercy seat. He wanted to sit on it. He wanted to be Christ. He wanted to be God. That was his first sin. That was what made him fall in the first earth age. We were quoting it a while ago, Ezekiel 28, verses 10 through uh, 18 and 19. And, and uh, certainly, uh, he is coming back and God makes it very clear. As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 9, he gives, your his, he gives Satan's name two times, once in Greek and once in Hebrew, so that you, you, don't, you can't miss. He gives it to you in two languages who the Antichrist is. That is to say, Apollyon and Ababdon. Ababdon in the Hebrew, Apollyon in the Greek, both meaning the destroyer, which is to say Satan the false one. Uh, he wouldn't let no one else. Uh, pl he plays many roles, and Antichrist is one of his main and final roles. Not final, but getting close. Bernice from Alabama. When the false Christ comes back again and I run into someone who says to me, the Lord has come, what do I say to them if they go into detail? 
Well, it, improvise. You know, you don't have to let someone hold you up. That shows a, a weakness in one. You, you're in a hurry. You've got to go. Sorry. See you later. Great, great, great. On and on. Aha. And just move on. You know, control the subject. Control your own life. Don't let someone else control it. And mostly let God control it. God will be with us strongly at that time. Of course, what you're talking about is where it would say in the book of Matthew, I believe it is, that if you pass a, if you pass an enemy in the byway, uh, don't agree with him or you'll end up before the judge. And uh, that's, or dis, don't disagree with him or you'll end up before the judge. Meaning after Christ appears, after the false Christ appears, if they're, they're going to be celebrating. You better get set for it. It's going to be a, a, quite a time. Heather from Virginia. This is a young person. My name is Heather, and I'm from Virginia. I love God, and I believe in Him, but I find it hard to, to not doubt Him in certain times. My mom tells me to pray about it, but I never seem to get an answer. My question is, how can I know whether He is there or that He will help me? with some of my uh, problems. But you know, um, Heather, I'm going to use what I said earlier for you. Do you know how many times it was that you thought you were really in trouble? And yet, because you kind of prayed about it, it just kind of went away. Wasn't, wasn't a big problem at all. Didn't amount to a hill of beans. You're from Virginia. You know what I mean by that. Didn't amount to a hill of beans. Why? Who do you think took care of that for you? You see, God speaks to us in many, many different ways. It may be a strong, strong, strong um, uh, message, that is to say, happening or circumstance, or it may be just a whisper. But God loves you, and He does hear you. That's His promise. And when He's ready, He will help you. You keep, but you must believe, okay? Okay, Marie from Texas. My question is, why do people think that they sold their souls to Satan when our souls already belong to God and our Heavenly Father? Please explain. Thank you. Well, they're in error. It, it is written in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, God speaking, All souls are mine. You know, you have these people, well, I think I will get around to giving my soul to God. That is so foolish. You've never read Ezekiel 18, 4, have you? God's got your soul. You're his child. He created you. He's got you in his hand. You are his to either destroy in the lake of fire, if that's what you deserve, or to love you as a loving child. That's it's up to you. Everybody writes their own destiny. They just don't realize it. But our Father is totally and completely fair. And, and you know, many might say, well, well, there is no, there is poor, and there is rich, and there is this, and there is that. Everybody is born into what they deserve from the first earth age. The beauty is that in loving Him, you always have the right to work your way out of it, to go up and not down. And um, uh, there's no sin in being poor. It's just kind of a sin to stay that way, you know. But poor is in the mind of many people. If you have the truth, you're rich. You're absolutely rich if you have the truth and knowledge of the end times. Jacob from California. I'm in the military, and I wonder if I were to engage an enemy and I kill them, would that be considered a sin or self-defense? As if it's an enemy of this nation that gives us the right under God to teach His Word and to live freely whereby we can enjoy that Word, you can have the freedom to attend church, to worship Him, then certainly God would say in Psalms 144, the soldier's prayer, give me the strength to get on the neck of my enemy and get him, okay? They're an enemy of God. Uh, you know, I'm an old combat Marine, 
And if I were to not understand God's Word to know that freedom doesn't come cheap. Freedom is bought with a price. And I know that many people perhaps don't realize that in its totality, but you have many people, uh, such as myself, that have fought and shed blood for this nation. Hey, it's a little rough out there, but it's worth it. And God approves it naturally. God takes down enemies. And that is the soldier's prayer, Psalms 144. I think you'll enjoy it. Don't ever forget it. And thank you for your service in this great nation. John from North Carolina, what is the difference in demons and fallen angels and how many of them do you think are on earth? Well, there's not one behind every bush. A fallen angel is an entity that leaves heaven and comes physically to earth bodily. An evil spirit is simply an evil spirit that comes to this earth from an entity there. You see, everyone has a spirit. I have a spirit. God has the Holy Spirit. My spirit is that I am driven to teach God's Word. And I can use that spirit to reach out to someone and try to convey the very Word of God. That, that is my spirit. Is there is nothing I can do about the being driven to teach the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But that spirit can change lives. But see, then uh, I would not be there in person, yet I may con my, my spirit may convert people in California, Alaska, or somewhere in China. We have more people in China than anywhere else that study with us by internet, and uh, basically, and uh, in foreign nations. Uh, but I'm not there, but my spirit is, and in in teaching. So and so it is with a fallen spirit. A fallen angel is when they come de facto, and a spirit is when they simply put their evil influence on you. You have power over both. There can be no fallen angels because God, as it is written in the book of Jude, verses 1 through 6, they're in chains and bondage until Satan appears at the sixth uh, seal and sixth trump. Many of them will come with him. Uh, Juna from Juna from Texas, is it wrong to say, if it be your will, meaning God's will? I was told I'm not supposed to say that. You were told incorrectly. I want you to make a note, and I don't want you to ever forget it. The first epistle of John, chapter five, verse fourteen. I'm going to say it again for you. First Epistle of John, not St. John, First Epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 14. You, if you love God, you don't want anything that isn't in His will. He knows what's best for us because He knows what tomorrow brings. We don't. And He knows whether we need something for tomorrow or not. Robert from Pennsylvania, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1, who is Melchizedek? Well, read on down to verse 3, and it tells you, absolutely identifies him in verse 3. What does it say? First of all, let's identify, let's translate rather than transliterate the word Melchizedek. To fully translate it, it means king of the elect, or king of the Zadok, just. It's God's elect, okay? Well, who is the king? Do you know anybody other than the king of kings and lord of lords? And then you read in verse 3 that he was likened to the Son of God. Why? He was the Son of God. Okay? Sue from Louisiana. Where in the Bible does it say God divorced Israel? Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. I mean, she was naughty. She slipped aside. He just wrote her a bill of divorcement. God is a divorcee. And um, he got rid of her. Okay? Now, uh, through the death of Christ, she's free to remarry again. That is to say, to come back into the covenant, the family, through salvation. Michael from Texas. 
In the third world age, will all the men and women be the same? Thank you. Well, there, be no, there will be no flesh, and we will all be in spiritual bodies, yes. Christ himself would say, you don't understand, you're going to be as the angels, meaning spiritual bodies, okay? Quite frankly, that is your real body. You're only passing through this earth age you were created millions of years ago in a spiritual body. And that spiritual body also dwells within this one. And when you die, kick the bucket, depart this realm, instantly your spiritual body steps out and you return to the Father that gave it. That is your real body. We've just got these chunks of meat to kind of get by here in this earth age because of Satan's rebellion trying to save as many people as we can. Lee from California, where does it say in the Bible that you will know your family members and where does it speak about two sides of the gulf? I think that's the fourth time in this lecture we've had that, the gulf is Luke 16. Now, where does it say you will know your family members? Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end is all millennium. In other words, we're all in spiritual bodies. In chapter 44, verse 20, 20 through 25, it declares that you will be able to help a mother, father, brother. The only way you could help them is if you recognize them, okay? End of story, and I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it. It's the letter He has sent to you telling you how to find happiness how to have a complete life. Makes his day. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. You know why? because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.